I'm Dr. Cassie Glaspie, and I have the um, privilege of introducing you to our speaker today, Dr. Christy Lewis, a treasured colleague of mine. She is also an alum from this department. She got her PhD in 2014, and um, she is an applied quantitative marine scientist. She focuses on many highly relevant issues in, along the Gulf Coast. Her latest um, funding has dealt with um, such things as harmful algal blooms and wetland loss. And so her research is very, very relevant to all that we do here in Louisiana. And um, that's probably the reason that we keep coming back and meeting each other as collaborators on various projects. <laughs> and another reason um, that I wanted to ask Christy to talk to you all today is because she is an excellent mentor. She speaks out for the rights of early career scientists and women in science. And she's recently been involved in a project that looked at the impacts of COVID-19 on early career scientists, women in science, and other marginalized groups in science. And so um, we definitely value her efforts there. And I'm going to um, let Chrissy take it from here. And she'll be talking today about applied ecological modeling. Thanks so much, Cassie. I appreciate it. And thanks, Robert, and everyone at LSU. Uh, I see some familiar names popping in the window there. So that um, that's pretty great. So I am going to do my best to uh, sh uh, share my screen properly. How does it look, everyone? All right. Well, everyone, thanks so much for being patient. Um, and I'm really happy uh, to be um, presenting to my alma mater. Um, I'm always a tiger, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. But I would like to start with a land acknowledgement and would like to acknowledge that Louisiana is a part of the ancestral and traditional territory of several indigenous groups including the Caddo Addo Indians of Louisiana, the Biloxi Chittimaca Confederation, the Chittimaca Tribe of Louisiana, the Choctaw Nation, the Cushada Tribe, the Four Winds Cherokee Tribe, the Muscogee Creek, the Point Al Shen Tribe, Tunica Biloxi Tribe, and the United Homa Nation. I acknowledge the history of Louisiana in which indigenous and diasporic groups were forever changed by the colonial violence, European induced diseases, forced movement, and removal. So before I dive into uh, my work today, I would like to let you know a little bit about where I sit at the University of Central Florida. So I am in the biology department. However, I was hired at um, University of Central Florida's UCF Coastal National Center for Marine, uh, National Center for Integrated Coastal Research. Um, and I don't sit in the biology department. I sit with um, these uh, nice gentlemen here that you'll see, and they're from various different departments, and our focus is really looking at coastal issues uh, from a broad transdisciplinary lens. So I sit with a, an, a resource economist, a civil engineer, a hazards geographer, a, a biomedical scientist, and a political scientist. So we're aiming to come at these complex problems from not just the siloed view of traditional academia. So um, just wanted to give you that context so that you know where I'm coming from. I am um, an, an ecological modeler by, by training. Uh, however, I do have this kind of broad research arc that I wanted to present to you. So I've got this you know, quantitative ecological modeling and analysis aspect to my lab. And of course we have to do, uh, in order to do ecological modeling, we have to collect some of those data sometimes. And so we do some ecological monitoring. And in the middle, bringing it all together is looking at action science, co-production, and also thinking about social ecological systems. So really understanding vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, Aldo Leopold that we are a part of the system, right? So um, this is just a really important context as we talk through the rest of uh, this presentation. So I wanted to just kind of let you know where I'm sitting. As far as the talk outline, I'm gonna give you a brief background to ecological modeling, and then we'll jump right in to a couple of projects that I've worked on uh, here in Louisiana. And uh, then another example of, of applied ecological modeling. So I'll go into detail on a couple of these and I'll skip over some of the details. Uh, these are all papers that are out and published or about to be published. Uh, so I really encourage you to go navigate to those papers uh, if you have additional questions or um, um, thoughts about this. So first I wanna talk about 
um, ecological modeling, a lot of people say ecosystem modeling, food web modeling, network modeling. So in this talk, I'll be using kind of those, those words interchangeably. Um, the way that we're, we look at different types of models are a simplified picture of reality to solve problems. Um, and as you can see in this, this slide, we have you know, models such as a model vessel or a model like a mesocosm or uh, you know, conceptual models um, that allow us to simplify a, a complex system. But it must, those systems must contain features that will help us understand or solve the management uh, or scientific uh, question being considered. And one thing that ecological modeling does that maybe some traditional statistical analyses uh, don't always capture is that it can be considered a synthesis. So oftentimes if folks are coming to me for uh, research, um, it's, it's, they have a whole lot of data and they wanna synthesize it and kind of paint a picture of, of their system that they're working in. And so um, ecological modeling, food web modeling is a really good way to do this. Um, and so we are a very data hungry field. We're always looking for data um, and we're always contacting folks and hoping for collaborations in that way. Um, models can be used for a, a bunch of different reasons, uh, obviously for research tools to, con to use to survey complex systems, like I mentioned. Uh, these modeling approaches can reveal system properties that we may not be able to see or ascertain from more simplified statistical models that then can reveal gaps in knowledge and thus set up some research priorities. What what monitoring programs do we need? What, where is our model not performing well? And does that mean we need to collect more data in order to help the model kind of reflect reality better? Obviously, it's gonna be used to test scientific hypotheses and simulate eco ecosystem reactions that can, can be compared with in situ observations. Um, but what I'm going to talk about here is a little bit of both, right? So we're going to be looking at using ecosystem models as a management tool. So um, in this way, in natural resource management, we'll generally be contacted by a state or federal, federal agency, and they'll ask for specific components or processes from the ecosystem that they want to see uh, modeled, um, and it's there to solve a specific problem, right? So point source pollution, habitat loss, dam removal, um, freshwater introduction into an estuary was very um, applicable here in Louisiana. So the modeling approach that I generally use is this package model called EcoPath with EcoSim and EcoSpace. If you've seen any of my talks before, you know this is where I always uh, end up. But I do want to say that we, you know, we do other types of ecosystem and food web modeling, but this is kind of where um, I hang my hat per se. Um, and so as I talk through uh, these case studies, you'll see that I have these uh, icons there. So this ecosystem modeling suite is built on three, um, three, three modules. So basically you have the EcoPath model itself, which is just that mass balance snapshot of the ecosystem, generally um, summarized over a year to five years to give us a little bit, you know, what goes into the system is equal to what's going out. So I'm not gonna get into any more of the complex modeling uh, uh, equations. There's going to be no differential equations, so please don't leave the don't leave the talk. Uh, we will um, then, as we get a mass balance snapshot of the system, we have uh, a temporal dynamic system. So basically, we can then take that snapshot and run it through time, uh, fit it to historical data, and see how well of a fit we can get there. And then another way that we can go about this is to kind of we could use the temporal dynamic simulations, but then we can also look at it as spatial temporal modeling. And so this is where, really where a lot of our effort is going to right now. There's a lot of advances, a lot of new aspects of the eco-space modeling. It's really complex because of the GIS data that has to go into it, but um, you'll see some of those outputs here. So what a lot of people may not know is, uh, if, if you know anything about EcoPath with EcoSim is that it's generally, um, if you can see my pointer, it's generally in this GUI interface, like this graphical user interface, and it <laughs> becomes a very, a very dangerous tool because, you know, anyone can go in here and start building ecosystem models because it is a click, a point and click interface. Um, and if you don't take the time to learn the inner workings of the background algorithms of the model, you could be 
conducting some pretty erroneous uh, and creating some pretty erroneous models. However, um, EcoPath is super flexible um, because it's built uh, in Visual Basic and it can be run on a command line, uh, which we've done. And it actually, uh, a colleague of mine, Sean Lucy at the Northeast Fishery Science Center has created RPATH, which is obviously the R version of, of EcoPath. And then another one of my colleagues, Aiken Koglu, uh, has created, um, and this is always making uh, folks happy who are coding in Fortran, and that this is a very old coding language, but still pretty applicable because of its ability to deal with high uh, throughput computing. So uh, lots of folks have taken EcoPath and, and used it um, and applied it in different ways. And it is the most widely used ecosystem modeling software in the world. Uh, so uh, there is something to be said about, about that. So where I'm gonna start now is kind of jump right into uh, one of the case studies from the paper that, that Kim DeMutzert and I and colleagues uh, created from this Louisiana coastal uh, area Delta management study. And I have a picture of the uh, interface here because this was an example of using EcoPath actually in the, in the GUI interface as well. So just kind of giving you some context on the differences uh, of how we use it. So the question that we were looking at in this study is, how do a select combination of river diversions affect the fish and shellfish in the river and uh, receiving basins uh, of these uh, proposed river diversions? So you can see in this picture here, we've got a couple of different proposed river diver diversions. And if you don't know what a river diversion is, um, I think most of you do, uh, but this is where we kind of, uh, kind of cut a piece through a levee of a river and we're reintroducing water, sediments and nutrients back into a system that is used to being flooded, uh, but now that the presence of the levees doesn't allow it to be flooded anymore. So we were looking at a select combination of these uh, freshwater flows into these, uh, to these systems. And the state of Louisiana and other members of federal uh, management agencies kind of brought a couple of us on board to develop models. Uh, so the, our team was the, the EcoPath with EcoSim and EcoSpace team. And we were meant to simulate changes in species biomass and catch, so fisheries catch. So one of the, the really positive things about uh, EcoPath it is, was built as a fisheries model, right? Can, how can we simulate different variations of catch levels, a mortality, fishing effort. And so we can actually some take, take in um, catch and landings data and then kind of see what the predicted um, outcome of that. So it's actually a pressure to the system. So then we used end-to-end -end model construction with a hydrodynamic model that was also composed of a sediment model, a veg model, and that model was Delft 3D. And uh, this is a, a, a coupling that we've been working on for years. So, an end-to-end -end model is where you take multiple types of models and one of the models or multiple models in between will absorb the output of the other. So in this case, uh, the Delft 3D model gave, gave us our environmental uh, parameters that goes into the model. So let's look, about, let's look at how that looks like in a conceptual model. So as you can see, it's, it's a quite complicated. So this is the whole eco space kind of, um, conceptual model where up here is Delft 3D. So there's lots of arrows going around everywhere. And, and uh, only thing I want you to see here is that it's super complex. There's a lot of data going in, there's a lot of data going out, and thus there's a lot of uncertainty in this model. However, because we're able to calibrate and then also validate a model. So if you know anything about statistical models or ecosystem modeling, re validation is really hard to do of a model because generally we're using all of the data we possibly can. And in order to validate if model output is really um, reflecting what we see in nature, we have to use information that uh, we you know, have gained from the system, but we're usually you know, taking all of that in. So we created a really um, a summarized way to validate this model. So uh, we feel pretty good about the outputs, but this is actually an area of growth in Capacity EcoSim. We're actually working on a true um, spatial validation uh, software right now as a plug into the system. So more to come on that. And so when we build these EcoPath food web models, um, it is definitely from the, the highest trophic levels, including fisher, fishers as a 
uh, as a, a, a functional group, if you will, or as, as someone that as some group that is putting pressure on the system as a take or a mortality. And then also down to the to the smallest groups of detritus um, and then things like marine mammals, the charismatic me megafauna. So we make some decisions about the groups and if they should be uh, juvenile or adult, uh, depending on our questions. But all the big players in the Louisiana system are in there and that you all should uh, be familiar uh, through, even if you just go to the Louis local Louisiana restaurants. So like I said before, the first part of building an ecopath model is creating that mass balance model. I'm not gonna get into the nuts and bolts of this, but there's a lot of data that goes in, a lot of parameters that we have to find or calculate. Um, and then once we do this, um, once we get all that information in there, we actually end up with uh, a balanced ecopath model that is who eats who in the system. So it does involve uh, understanding the diets of all of these species and who, um, who eats who. After that point, we generally have been doing a calibration stage and the time dynamic portion of EcoPath that we call EcoSim. And so we take these in situ data um, graciously given to, given to us by uh, the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. They have been a constant partner with us uh, over the years and have been so gracious in providing their data. So we, we, take, we consume those data, we process those data, we put them into the system and then we get uh, model fit. So if you know anything about uh, doing some of like some basic regression modeling, this is a, basically a reduction of the sum of squares, uh, but it's done in a little eco, eco sim kind of weird way that I won't get into. Uh, but you can see that some of the species fit better than others. And so we take that into consideration when we're actually evaluating the output. So we can make some changes to the model to try to get it to fit really well. But what we find is when we have good fishing information about uh, the systems in Louisiana, then we tend to get a really good fit to the data. So you can see that a lot of the, the, the dynamics in Louisiana are driven by fisheries. At that point, um, once we had a really good calibrated model, we can go into the spatial tempo temporal component of the model. Uh, and so this is that end-to-end -end linkage with the Delft 3D hydrodynamic model where they can produce the salinity, temperature, chlorophyll A, even marsh habitat. Um, and what this does is that the organisms have to have some kind of relationship with the system and they have to know which, uh, which where to live. And so what we do is we take a, a spatial grid as you see here and these grids are, uh, we have, you know, grid cells in every single, um, on every single one of these layers. And, and there's one value of salinity, one value of temperature, one value of percentage of marsh habitat in this cell. And so every single, we can put in as many layers as you want, dissolved oxygen, you know, salinity, temperature, uh, uh, anything that you can think of that you want in the model uh, can go in. However, in order for the organisms to respond to these changes, we have to tell them or uh, we have to do the research to figure out what is the optimum range for these organisms. And so that's where we get to these response curves, which it determines the effect of each of these drivers on each individual species. So this is another data intensive thing that we do. Um, so for every single species in the model and every single life stage, we have to consider uh, the differences in salinity and temperature and how they respond. So these kind of trapezoidal curves, if you will, um, allow us to show the optimum values of where these organisms live. And I should say that we work very closely uh, with CPRA, LDWF, NOAA Fisheries, US Army Corps of Engineers, and these were all developed collectively together. So, um, and this is just something that we didn't um, do uh, kind of in a silo. So all of this was done collectively with the managers. And so at that point in time, we have a great functioning model. So then we can start thinking about what's gonna happen in the future. Uh, what if we open all four diversions at the same time? What if we just open the two uh, upper diversions? What if we just open the two lower diversions or any combination there in between? So what we did is we ran a series of production runs where we had eight different variations uh, and we ran it into the future for 50 years. And so this output that we're gonna see, which is generally representing the biomass of those organisms, 
is they, how they respond to water quality, habitat availability, trophic interactions, and fishing pressure. When we run these models, we get tons and tons and tons of data. So what you see here is just uh, six species. And then what we're showing is the first year of the model run. So this is the first year of the model run. And obviously the red, uh, the red or the more warmer uh, colors indicate higher biomass. And uh, this is the end of the run. So this is year 50 with a future without action. So if we just didn't have any diversions whatsoever, what would happen? And this is just an example of one of the production runs. And um, this is production run six, which I believe is for the, uh, for the diversions open. I could be wrong because I don't quite remember to be honest. But that said, obviously this is a lot of information. We get these, these output maps for every month in 50 years for all of the species in the model and for all of the landings and catch data in the model. So you can imagine that as modelers, we have to report this information uh, out to the managers. And so we try to do that in a couple of different ways. So one way we can do that is zoom in. Let's just look at what would happen with brown shrimp at year 50 in the month of June. So we can see with the future without action, we can see kind of the, the spread of the shrimp over the system. But if we over here, if we open four diversions, you can see that the biomass is kind of, kind of going to the edges of the estuary. So they seem to be going uh, kind of outward to where it's probably uh, more saline. Another way we can organize the findings of our data is to kind of look at this uh, from a change of the baseline. And if we look at it over the whole system, we might lose some of the, uh, the really important factors that fish, most of our fish, not oysters, uh, can move, right? So if they don't like an area, they can move. Um, and so you can see that these are just kind of the different areas of Barataria and Breton Sound and this is uh, a decrease from the baseline or an increase from the baseline. You can see there's a lot going on in Middle Barataria Bay. So that seems to be one of the, that, this kind of coincides with some previous research that says that the middle parts of the basin are gonna be uh, the most susceptible to changes in freshwater inflow. So what did we decide? What decision was made from here? So using this information and a plethora of other information, CPRA, and uh, all of the advisors uh, saw, seeing that the spatial patterns were suggesting that the two lower diversions were mostly responsible for some of the changes. So again, using some of this information, not all of it, they took into account uh, kind of the reactions and kind of focus more on the, the upper diversions. And so um, I'll just kind of leave that there and for now we'll come back to this in just a few minutes. So this is one example, this Delta management project of an end-to-end -end modeling. So there's also a whole nother a body of work that we were doing kind of at the same time. And this paper has just come out uh, last month, uh, which is the end-to-end -end modeling in terms of the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan that we also worked on, that Kim DeMutzert and I and, and others also worked on. And so in this way, this was an example of using EWE uh, via the command line. So we took the GUI graphical interface on and we linked up uh, with the larger model of the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan. And most of you know uh, or have heard of the Coastal Master Plan. So we worked on the 2017 Master Plan to respond to the, the land loss in, in the Louisiana system and threats from storm events. Um, the ultimate goal uh, obviously is to figure out which restoration projects to, that will build or maintain land and reduce uh, risk to our communities. And so this tool that you can find on the CPR website is one of those ways that you can kind of game with the model outcomes. And so you can see here, uh, this is coastal vegetation at year zero at a medium sea level rise scenario. And then if you run it for 50 years without any restoration, you can see the change in the types of vegetation as you go 50 years into the future. So not only were we looking at, um, you know, different restoration projects. They're looking at different levels of climate change because we actually don't know how much climate change is going to affect us. So they looked at it at low, medium, and high levels. And then of course, all of these little dots you see on this map are the different types of restoration um, projects and configura configurations. And so 
Um, this was a, an enormous undertaking. Coastal Master Plan is always an enormous undertaking. And if you look at this large interdisciplinary team of modelers um, and researchers, you can start looking at, you know, look at here are the, the restoration and coastal projects. Here are these models. So this information feeds into the predictive models. And so that planning tool is kind of the outcome. So we came in here at these ecosystem outcomes. And, and this is where I'm gonna leave this for now. I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty. The paper just come out, so go read it. Um, but definitely um, this is something that we're, a lot of work went into and running the, the Ecopath software on the command line was a really successful uh, attempt at uh, using Ecopath with uh, a large management and restoration program. So I told you I'd come back quickly to from the Delta Management Project. So when the Delta Management Project kicked off and we were building that model, um, at the same time, another food web model was being built and we did that in, in, in concert. So we had all of the research managers, NOAA, Army Corps of Engineers, CPRA, LWF. Um, and so they actually were so intuitive to think, we can't just, there's so much uncertainty in ecological models. Um, so it what we can do is look at two different food web models at the same time. And so the other food web model um, is called CHASM. And so at the same time this was going on, uh, we were uh, a couple of our colleagues, also LSU grads. Um, so Kim and I were working on the EWE uh, modeling and Shea Sable and, and others, our Louisiana grads were working on the chasm development. And so what we did was we built those models, we wrote our reports, we wrote our publications, but then uh, the, um, the groups came back to us and they wanted us to do some more analyses. So uh, one thing is, you know, I kind of alluded to it, like what is, why are we going to use multiple models to answer one resource question? Well, when you think about multiple models in general, like what is the most common example of multi multiple model implementation? Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, right? So every almost every country in the world that cares about this is building a climate model and they're all in agreement. They all can take into consideration uncertainty and biases. And so um, we're really trying to implement this in uh, natural resource management now. So this is kind of like the next big push. And I'm, I'm just really pleased that CPRA had the, had the vision to say, you know, we really need to see not just one model, but two models. And so let me tell you a little bit more about this project. So here's the team. Some of these folks might look familiar to you. Uh, and so we had an expert panel uh, of, of modelers who helped guide this, this project. And then we had the ecological modelers, which was, was of course me, uh, Kim DeMutzard and Shea Sable, again, all Louisiana State University graduates. And so we were kind of asked by uh, the, the TIG, uh, which is the Louisiana uh, Trustee Implementation Group. Uh, and so we were asked, they're, had, they're kind of moving forward on this mid Barataria sediment diversion project. It's in the permitting phase. So now we have to think about this environmental impact study that they're conducting. And to assess uh, the structure and the energetics of the food web, they wanted to find a way to see if we could use both of these models, not in comparison, but at the same time to account for some of the uncertainty in each of the models and kind of to elevate each model and work on its strengths. And so in this way, we could provide information back to, to the uh, implementation groups and to the managers about how um, this proposed sediment diversion that was you know, initially decided on in that Delta management project. So the models itself, again, it were the EWE model that I just presented to you and the comprehensive aquatic system model uh, from, that we call CHASM. And so what we did um, was we, wanted to take um, a little bit of this, of the strength of the models, like I said, and then we had some guidance from the Louisiana Trustee Implementation Group. They didn't want us to change any of the outputs. They didn't want us to make the models better. They didn't want us to run new simulations. They wanted to use the models as is so that we could figure out a way uh, to uh, just get some information because they were they felt very confident in the models that we had produced in the past. And so they wanted to see what we could learn from just using the models. And, and that was 
coming from a, a series of reports that uh, Kenny Rose and others uh, worked on to kind of make that recommendation to the state. And so what we did was an EWE, we considered how can we kind of um, look at the system uh, and get an input, get an understanding of how changing salinity regimes per se and temperature and chlorophyll A can impact the food web dynamics. And so what we did was we, we created a little program where we could actually uh, run the EcoPath model as is in the EcoSim and then kind of chunk out time slices. So we did not go into EcoSpace. So we definitely were in uh, the EcoSim only temporal phase here. And so what we did was we chunked out um, June 2008, June 2010, uh, June uh, 2013, and the same for October. So kind of high flow months and low flow months from the river. And so what we used CASM was we looked at the spatial component. So this is where we were able to capture the spatial uh, aspect of the system. So where you see the yellow stars, those are, uh, those are the different lines you see uh, for salinity, chlorophyll A, and temperature that we pulled together from these different areas of the system. And so in each one of these cells and chasm would be the food web model. Um, and so then, and for EWE, we would have, um, you know, different food web models for every one of these months and years, so six in total. So I always have to put a picture in here of uh, field work because everybody also that are marine biologists, they're always, you know, in the water doing something fun, but when you're an ecosystem model, oftentimes this is what uh, this is what field work looks like. So uh, we met uh, three or four times as a team to kind of talk through and how can we best use the models to answer the questions uh, for the managers. And so it was just a really great time. I really um, love sitting in a room with really smart people trying to figure out the answers and we get so much done. So um, I, I like to do uh, do these like mini workshops to to get some of these projects off the ground. So what we decided to do was an ecological network analysis across both models to give us an indication of the structure and energetic pathways of the simulated food webs. And in this way, we can use species biomasses, the structure of the food web, the speed and efficiency of the energy flows from primary production and from detritus and then look at the qualitative properties of the higher order food web characteristics that we can talk about as resilience or ecosystem health. So I'm not gonna really go into the background of ecological network analysis, but it is vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Bobby Lonowitz and all of the work that he's done in network modeling um, for, for many, many years. So uh, yeah, so that is, if you want to read more about that, I have a new paper coming out as well, where we did it. We built um, four food web models in, uh, off Dolphin Island, and we did a really an intense network analysis. So that's coming soon. So stay tuned for that as well. And that will give you a little bit more background in ecological network analysis. So I'm going to get right to the results and not get any to any of the more of the details. So what did we find using these uh, food web models kind of collectively um, about and we specifically focused on Barataria Bay. So detritus plays a very important role in the energetics of the system, which is no surprise to anybody who works in estuaries. We know that detritus is a really important component. We also found that the food web shows a response of increased productivity after the spring high flow season through specific dominant pathways. Most of us kind of like, oh yeah, we know that for sure. But it was interesting to see uh, how the flow of energy changed and how the dominant pathways kind of uh, dictated the ecosystem. We also uh, considered that the trophic uh, pyramid was truncated. It, again, something that has been published on in Louisiana for many years, but it was interesting to see uh, both models uh, bringing that information together in a coordinated manner. And finally, compared to other estuaries, the system has many potential pathways for energy transfer. And spoiler alert, that means that it has the ability to change uh, to change and respond well to disturbance because it can switch energy flows in the system. So we can dive into these um, a little bit more. So the results, um, the first one, detritus plays a very important role in energetics of the system. Um, in CASM, 16% of the system is driven by uh, 
detritus, whereas in EWE, it's 36%. And what we're showing here, are these are the output of the food webs where each node represents the amount of biomass in the system. So as you can see, these are all the kind of the primary producer uh, trophic levels on the X -axis, or the Y axis here. So phytoplankton and benthic algae, you can see detritus is, is a huge part of the system here. Um, so we're just highlighting that. And this is just a visual way to think about it. Both models did also suggest that there was a net production of new detritus in the system. Um, we also talked about the food web shows an increased response to the productivity after the high flow season. And using um, ecological network metrics, which uh, some of them are found here, specifically total system throughput, which is really how much energy is moving through the system. It's a measure of that. And you can see that in June, in the EcoPath model, we see high numbers as compared to October uh, in, in all of these models. So we can see there's a big difference in how much energy is coming through the system depending on the season. So this is a Lindemann spine. So this is kind of getting back to, to uh, original um, uh, ecology here. So this might be familiar to some and not to others, but this is basically taking this food web model and shrinking it down into a, a food chain, right? And so what you can see here are these values um, this is the biomass. So this is primary producers and then the trophic levels moving up. But you can see that between here, trophic level two and three, there's a huge drop off of biomass. So this is what we're saying, the trophic pyramid is truncated. So this is EWE and this uh, from June 2010 and this is June 15, Polygon 10. And you can see also again that between here and here, there's a huge drop off in, in production and biomass moving through the system. Um, and then, let's see, make sure I didn't miss that. And then compared to other estuaries, uh, this system has many potential pathways for energy transfer. So we're gonna look at um, this value of ascendancy over capacity. So these are very much information theory words that you may not be familiar with, but basically the A over C ratio indicates the predictability of energy flows within the food web. So where is the packet of energy as consumers eat each other, eat, uh, their prey, where is that energy going to go? And so food webs that have a dominant biomass species and only have a small number of them will have a pr more predictable energy flow. So in such a case, we can say that with relative certainty that we know which, uh, which given energy par parcel is going to go. So um, it will be a, a dominant species with higher biomass with a large flow of energy going into it. But a low AC value would indicate that a food web ha uh, with a large number of flows and a relatively uniform magnitude. So, right, so there are uniform flows flowing up kind of in the same amount. So, in general, we can say that low AC systems are thought to be more robust to disturbance um, because they have redu redundant pathways uh, for energy flow in case any single one of these species or species groups are disturbed. So what you can see here is that the ascendancy capacity ratio um, is about 30 uh, for Barataria Bay. And if you wanna compare that to uh, Florida Everglades, for instance, uh, they, it ranges some values from uh, a colleague of mine, Sheila Heyman, uh, showed that uh, it was ranging from 34 to 52 at times. So there seems to be something really robust about Louisiana systems in, in some ways. So what are the implications of these results? So what we can say from our findings is that there's a short-term energy reserve in the system um, because of the detritus surplus. Uh, changes in flow could alter the seasonal benefits to productivity, altering lower trophic level species to transfer energy to the higher order species. The biomass organized at lower trophic levels, so we're talking about the truncated systems here, and since the low trophic level species have high turnover rates, uh, there's potential for high gro growth rates over short periods of time. And thus they have the ability to uh, be resilient to short term disturbances. So we're talking about brown shrimp, white shrimp there. And redundant food web connections help reduce the danger of severe limitation of predators. So it's important uh, groups are eliminated or fisheries disturbances, uh, fisheries pressure or disturbances are really altering. There seems to be a lot more 
uh, movements in the system so it can and it can absorb a lot of these uh, a lot of these changes over time. So I think I'm gonna leave it there for now, but I, I did want to sum it up um, and talk about just kind of provide some conclusions. This is a lot of information. I'm sure you might have some questions, but I do want to you know talk about the consideration of ecosystem model and that in that careful evaluation and testing of ecosystem models enables um, an understanding of the strengths and limitations of using them, those models. So in this last example, I demonstrated that the results from these two alternative models in Barataria is scientifically sound and practical approach for dealing with complexities of ecosystems and food webs and how they may respond to environmental variation, resource management action and disturbances. So in the Delta Management Plan and the Coastal Master Plan that I briefly mentioned, we showed how complex systems could be linked to provide valuable insight to managers making serious decisions about the fate of restoration decisions in Louisiana. But I do want to say clearly that ecological modeling is not the only tool that we need to understand how Louisiana respond to the pressures of sea level rise or continued marsh loss. But I contend that it's an important tool in our toolbox that can allow us to see the range of possible outcomes in the next 50 years. And then a critical aspect to all of these projects was that there was iterative and consistent coordination between model developers, outside scientists, natural resource managers, all working together in a collaborative manner. So we, we all knew what was going on at one particular time and everybody was giving input. So the use of end-to-end -end modeling and ensemble modeling, as demonstrated here, provides a scientific step and a significant step towards co-production of knowledge for the use in natural resource management decisions. So action science and co-production of knowledge are kind of a big move that NOAA Fisheries and, and other NOAA calls are, are putting into a lot of their um, requests for proposals these days. And you know, as a fishery scientist by training, you know, action science is something that we do all the time. We work with uh, we work with the, the council, we work with managers, we work with natural resource uh, officers. And so we're always working together to kind of create an outcome. But the co-production of knowledge is an interesting, and I believe the next advancement that we're looking for. So when the state of Louisiana came to us to ask us to do the model, they had already identified the problem. What's the problem? Louisiana is losing marsh at ridiculous <laughs> rates. And so they are, we already knew the problem. So co-production that by definition means that the scientists and the managers and whatever stakeholders are kind of working together to define the project at the beginning before they're before we actually know exactly the problem that we're going to undertake so while these examples that i showed you today were not necessarily co-production by definition i believe louisiana is ahead of the game and how they've kind of approached uh, using ecosystem models and using these big collaborative uh, teams of modelers to come up with potential outcomes of restoration scenarios in, in the light of, of sea level rise and climate change. So I'm really encouraged by uh, what I see in Louisiana. And now that I live in Florida, you can see why I haven't. Um, I still work in Louisiana and we're still um, kind of doing going to the next step with what we're doing with these models. And I'm working on a couple of projects uh, with some of the colleagues here at LSU and uh, Tulane. So there are things going on and, and I can't quite leave Louisiana because it's, it's in my heart. But um, I, I think I'll leave it there for now. And um, I really appreciate your time and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you, it was a great talk. So anyone who has questions, you can just message them directly to me or if we're kind of organized about it, we can always like unmute and turn the cameras on, it's whatever you guys want. Hey, Christy, this is Cassie. I have a question. Sure, go for it. Do you find that the ecosystem managers that you are working with find your um, suggestions when you make them to be reasonable? Like, I'm especially thinking about the suggestion to not include the lower two diversions in the restoration plan. Is that viewed as reasonable? Yeah, I think so. And, and you know, frankly, we're, we're not always being that strong, Cassie, with what we're recommending. We kind of put the results out there and um, then let the, the managers and the, res the research managers kind of make those decisions. But I mean, I think there is always hesitation with, 
um, kind of interpreting the ecosystem model output, um, as you well know. And I think, like I said, I think Louisiana is ahead of the game and using this ensemble modeling approach. Um, and I really think that that, and that was before it was kind of, before it was cool. Um, so kind of ahead of the game, which is, is a really cool thing. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. Um, so initially you mentioned that it's very important to have um, observational data. I, I seem to recall for, I guess, giving inputs to your, your models, right? Sure. So do you think that there's a lot of sensitivity right now in the model to the kind of patchiness in observations that you can use to feed into the model? Uh, definitely. I mean, I think that it kind of depends on the model itself um, and the size of the cells and in our particular case in ecospace, like how, how big are those cells? So that's exactly why we go, it, we leave the temporal alone and go into the, the, the spatial temporal component so that we can get at that patchiness. And that's exactly how we need to get at the, you know, if we're looking at oyster populations, right? Because we have to limit where the oysters live because they only live in certain locations because of culture and limitations like that. So yeah, that's a good question, but it definitely gets that. That's one of the main reasons uh, we go, go into the, the spatial component is so we can see those patchiness. Um, and then also so that we can see fish move because if it's just an temporal model, they just die. And we know yeah. that's not the truth, right? <laughs> so we wanna see them move to a place that they're happier. Okay. So Ken has a question. I'll just read it. Uh, mm -hmm. So was there any consideration given to simulating a restoration approach based on natural episodic delta switching over long time frames? It seems this idea has been forgotten much of the time when river diversions are considered. No, but um, I'm actually, that's a great question, Ken. Um, but we're, uh, I just submitted a proposal to kind of look at the input and this is an Apalachicola Bay. Um, so not in Louisiana, but we could totally uh, look at it here. Um, but uh, we're going to be looking at natural variability over uh, historical, so the last um, 30 years. So we're kind of going to look at how natural variability, so you can think about, you know, especially in Louisiana, you've got hurricane events, you've got, you know, large, larger tide events, storm surge, and then when those things kind of all pile up on one, then the, the outcomes can be pre-catastrophic, but generally they're not occurring in phase, right? So if you get a, a really high tide or if you get a hurricane, they're not kind of happening at the same time. But with natural variation, there is the possibility for those things to occur in phase. And so I think it's a, a really next phase of, of, of our work is going to be looking at what could potentially happen given what we know about what kind of big um, extreme events have occurred. And then how can we consider those just right now, not considering climate change at all, but just what we know about what has happened in the past and if we can put those in phase. Secondarily, um, I am working on a project in the Indian River Lagoon and in the coast of Oaxaca, Mexico, where I'm working directly with a um, paleogeologist and archeologist kind of building ancient food web models and then trying to, re, um, trying to consider changes in the hydrologic cycles over time. So I am working on that. I just haven't found collaborators in Louisiana in a project to make that happen. But I, that is, I've written a grant on that before while I was still in Louisiana, it didn't get funded. So I, it is on my radar. I just wanna, just need to try to find the right funding agency to do that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, if there are any other questions, you guys should send them now. Otherwise, I just wanna thank Dr. Lewis for, for your time. Any questions? Well, I have I don't have any more questions. Um, I guess everyone's satisfied. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, everyone.